packed with cooking tips, information, and 100 recipes to stake your life on. Right, this is my guide to cooking with spice. Adding big, gutsy flavours using spices at the beginning of cooking and then simply letting the dish slow cook is a brilliant way of getting maximum flavour with minimum effort. My first recipe melts in the mouth. And because the oven does most of the work, it's a cinch to make. Slow-cooked, fiery lamb. Cooking's all about being bold and adventurous. And this dish is exciting because it's slowly cooked. And the longer it cooks, the more flavoursome it becomes. Marinating the lamb first. Chilies, we're going to use a mixture of red and green. Take off the tops and just slice in. Garlic, crushed. Don't worry about chopping these ultra-fine, just get it in there. Cooking for up to three hours, everything sort of blends and almost sort of purees itself together. Smoked paprika, goes brilliantly well with the chilies. Two teaspoons in. A touch of dried oregano. Some little cumin seeds. The blend and the fragrance that they give out is extraordinary. They release a little oil as well and helps to tenderize the lamb. Touch of salt, pepper, cinnamon. That sort of sweetens up the lamb. Olive oil, just a tablespoon. And the olive oil helps to sort of stick all those wonderful spices to the lamb. Jump in, just start really rubbing. At this stage, you can leave the lamb to marinate for anything from half an hour to overnight. Allowing the spices to really penetrate the meat, giving amazing results when you tuck in. Delicious. Vegetables, carrots and onions. And that's it. Sliced. Secret of slicing, vegetables for braising is not getting too thin. You slice the onions too thin, they burn. You've got that horrible char taste on that slow braise. Braising is just a chef's term that means cooking in liquid on a low heat, making the meat incredibly moist and beautifully tender. So the secret of braising is having a really nice, thick, durable pan. Get that nice and hot. Just a touch of olive oil. Lamb in, hold the bone, because you're in control then into the pan. I want that white fat to start rendering, so it'll add more fat, therefore making it a lot more flavoursome as it braises. Chilies, cinnamon in, mix that up. And don't be scared, you're not burning this, you're sort of searing the lamb shanks, and this is the important part right at the very beginning. We're getting a colour on the lamb, which washes off as it braises in the oven, so be generous with that colour. Vegetables in. Wow. And then a couple of bay leaves. So now you lift the lamb up and get the lamb sat on top of the vegetables. Now you glaze the pan with red wine. Deglazing means that you're, you're cleaning the bottom of the pan and you're getting that amazing flavour washed off and lifted up into that sauce. It can really transform that dish. Always deglaze. Then bring to the boil and cook for about 10 minutes to reduce. The wine's reduced down by half. Now for the stock. Bring that stock back up to the ball and then into the oven. Now, don't cover it. When you cover it, all the condensation comes off the lid. Your lamb becomes grey. All this effort and that exciting spice gets washed away. No lid and into the oven for three hours. A slow cook on a low heat of 160 degrees gives the spices time to work and transform the meat so it's mouth-wateringly tender. Now, look at those. Out on to a plate. You can just see that meat sliding down. Juicy and incredibly tender. Grab it by the, the shank, roll them around that rich, delicious sauce. Look at that. You can get your sauce. Nice. Beautiful. Just get some mint. Don't chop it. Just pick that fresh mint and let it snow. And there you go, a very spicy, delicious, melting in the mouth, lamb shank. Amazing. To get the most out of your spices, there's only one piece of kit that you need. Pestle and mortar. I mean, they look fantastic and it's essential for any good kitchen. These things are so versatile. 
These ancient kitchen tools are perfect for everything, from pestos to dressings, and cost from around 15 quid. Use to grind spices and you'll max out on flavour. Get perfect textures and always be totally in control. Make sure you've got a nice, large circumference of the bowl so you can grind away. The heavier and the more durable they are, the more confidence it gives you when you're pounding. And there's almost a way of confirming homemade, hand-pounded. Grab yourself a pestle and mortar and soon you'll be spicing with ease. Spices are a brilliant way to add an extra layer and a depth of complexity to any dish. Learning to use them properly will really improve your cooking. Here are three more of my super simple spice recipes to get you going. First up, a very easy chilli and spice white bait. Start with the spice coating. Toast Szechuan peppercorns and coriander seeds in a hot dry pan to release their flavours. Add chilli flakes and grind in a pestle and mortar to make a fiery fine powder. Combine with plain flour, season and mix. Add olive oil to a hot pan. Coat white bait in the spicy flour mix, then fry. White bait are an oily fish that are healthy, delicious and cook in minutes. Once golden, they're done. Fantastic with garlic mayonnaise or a simple squeeze of lemon. Ready in under 10 minutes, chilli and spice white bait, an easy, simple, spicy dish. My next amazingly aromatic recipe is roasted squash hummus. Start with my take on Raz Al Hanout, a classic Moroccan spice blend. In a dry pan, toast cinnamon, cloves, coriander, fenugreek and fennel seeds. Then add mustard seeds and cumin. When the seeds start to pop, they're ready. Add paprika and grind into a fine powder. For the hummus, Peel and chop butternut squash. Put on a baking tray and add garlic, simply bashed, and chopped ginger. Drizzle with olive oil, season, and sprinkle over the spice mix. Then roast in a hot oven for half an hour until soft. Allow to cool and place in a blender. Add tahini, a nutty paste made from sesame seeds. Cooked chickpeas a dash of lemon juice and a drizzle of olive oil. Blitz until luxuriously creamy and textured. Spices toasted for maximum flavour. Amazing roasted squash hummus. My final deliciously spicy dish is curry spice sweet corn soup. First, the fragrant curry paste. Roast coriander and cumin seeds into aromatic. Then grind, adding crushed garlic, chilli powder, turmeric and finely chopped ginger. Bring together with olive oil to form a thick paste. For the soup, fry finely chopped onions in olive oil. Add the curry paste and cook to release the flavours. Add cubed potatoes, chicken stock, and season. When the potato has softened, stir in cream corn. Then add whole sweet corn kernels with some of the juices. And transfer to a blender and blitz until smooth. For texture, add more whole sweet corn. Heat and it's ready to serve. Wonderfully satisfying curried spice sweet corn soup that packs an amazingly aromatic punch. Three more stunning recipes that make cooking with spice simple. Incredible. Welcome back to my ultimate cookery course. 
This is my guide to cooking with spice. Next up, my shopping guide to buying spices. When I buy my spice, I only want the best, and it always pays to get expert advice. Birgit Erath has been selling every spice under the sun in London's Notting Hill for over 20 years, so she really knows what she's talking about. I love spices, the smell, the texture, the colour. Spices are so versatile. Something very, very simple it can be really transformed into something really delicious. With thousands of aromatic ingredients on her shelves, if it smells good, she sells it. If you buy spices, buy them whole. Then you can try roast them, grind them when you need them, and then they will release the essential oils. Whole spices you can keep for years. Give them a good bushing <laughs> wine bottle with your rolling pin or whatever, and you see there is still aroma, and you can taste it, you smell it, then it's fine. There's four main spices. One is sweet, one is sour, one is bitter, and one is hot. This is cinnamon. And that is really a great example of a sweet spice. When you buy a cinnamon quill like this, you have to check that you have loads of different layers in here. Then you can either grind this or you'd break a piece off. I mean, this doesn't smell of anything now, but if you roll it in your hand, just quickly like this, and then you smell it again, this is just unbelievable. If you have spaghetti bolognese, put a pinch of cinnamon in it to bring out the flavor. Sumac, this is one of those really special spices. Sour, like a lemon, but it has a salty aftertaste. I use this anywhere from marinades to salad. You haven't lived unless you tried it. A great example for a bitter spice would actually be uh, turmeric. This is actually a root. It grows in the ground like ginger. Use it very, very sparingly. About that much will actually color you a curry or a rice dish, wonderful yellow. Watch your fingers, you get really yellow fingers from it. And then we come to the hot spices. One spice that I couldn't miss, and that is Hungarian paprika. Paprika is the powdery form of a bell pepper. What makes the Hungarian paprika different is that they actually grow it on vineyards. It's sort of between the vines. It has a, a sweetness and it has a sharpness to it. I have it in ice cream, I have it on fish, I have it everywhere. Birgit's spot on about the power of spices to transform dishes, whether savoury or sweet. Here's my quick guide to the spices I use most. Black pepper. This is the spice I couldn't do without. Always buy it whole and grind yourself so you get the freshest flavour. Cardamom. These pods come in green or black types and have a fantastic spicy sweet taste. Brilliant for everything from curries to rice dishes and puddings. Coriander. These citrusy seeds are perfect whole in pickles or grind to use in fragrant stews and soups. Cumin, a savoury spice that's pungent and nutty. It's great in marinades for delicious meat and fish. Then cinnamon, sweetly fragrant and great with apples or in cakes. And nutmeg, warm and spicy, it's delicious in a bechamel sauce. Finally, saffron. These sweet strands infuse a brilliant bright red colour and are great in risottos, and even though it's more expensive than gold, a pinch goes a long, long way. Store your spices properly, and they'll last for years. You keep it airtight in a tin or in a glass jar in your cupboard. Don't be scared of spices, like an aftershave or a perfume. You have to select it yourself. It has to fit in with your taste and with your kitchen. Supermarkets and good local shops sell an amazing array of different spices, so there's no excuse for not being adventurous. Be bold, find what you like, and spice up your cooking. Like all chefs, I love the challenge of transforming classic recipes, giving them a new twist to make them modern and vibrant. To keep old dishes fresh and exciting, it's great to get spicy. My next recipe is a time-honored British classic. But with the addition of spices, it's given a new lease of life. Fragrant spice rice pudding. I love cooking with spices, but you don't have to just cook savoury dishes. Using aromatics and spices across desserts takes your puddings to a completely different level. First off, our spices. This is a fresh vanilla pod. Fragrant and packed full of flavour. Use the back of the knife and flatten it. That removes all those little seeds off the skin of the vanilla pod. Take your knife, slice down the middle. And then when you open that up, the smell 
is incredible. Take the tip of the knife and you scrape inside and look, all those seeds dying to come out. That is incredible. There are thousands of seeds still ingrained to the pod, so put them in to the casserole. Cardamom, powerful, spicy. Take two little pods, place your knife on top, and lightly crack them. Cracking the cardamom pods helps release all the amazing flavour. Cloves, gives it that kind of aniseed flavour with a lot of depth. One, two, three. Cinnamon stick, snap and in. Just smelling that level of fragrance, you can imagine what the rice pudding is going to taste of. Turn on the heat, lightly toast those spices just a couple of seconds. And what's going to happen is just going to sort of enhance those spices in a way that it just draws out an even more powerful fragrance. Coconut milk in. Sugar. Two tablespoons. Milk. And then a couple of tablespoons of cream. Bring it slowly to the boil to allow the flavours to infuse. And this rice pudding reminds me of my time in India, where I got really into that chai tea fragrance because it was just so delicious and so comforting. Take a lime in. The lime just cuts through the richness of the coconut, gives it that nice little bit of acidity. Goes fantastically well with the cinnamon and that fresh vanilla. Nice. Have a taste. Mm. Now, let's come up to the boil. Give it a nice little clean round the outside and in with the rice. Use 200 grams of pudding rice. Don't wash it beforehand because the starch helps thicken the rice pudding in the oven. And just turn that down to a light simmer. And the pudding rice starts to open up and it absorbs all that coconut, vanilla, cardamom, clove, and cinnamon. Bring it up to the ball gently and cook it out for three to five minutes. Boiling it rapidly, the rice opens up and it goes into mush. So we want to keep that nice texture, that sort of fragrant rice pudding on a gentle simmer. Next, a little luxury. I'm going to show you how I take this simple, delicious, aromatic rice pudding to a completely different level. Here's what I do. Take two egg yolks, separate them. Now give that a really nice whisk. Two nice tablespoons of mascarpone cheese. Whisk that into the egg yolks. Just so it's nice and smooth. It's almost like finishing the rice pudding in a delicious custard. Turn off the gas, add that into the rice pudding. And what happens, it starts to enrich and really thicken this rice pudding and takes it to a completely different level. The rice is still not cooked, but it's starting to go nice and soft. You can just see how it's opening up. But look, it's like rich, aromatic lava bubbling away. Finally, Great more citrus zest. The lime on top. Roasted, caramelised lime zest on top of a rice pudding is phenomenal. Then put it in the oven for 15 minutes at 200 degrees to finish cooking the rice and develop the intensely aromatic flavours. Look at that. An incredibly fragrant rice pudding. How beautiful does that look? Spices are a brilliant way of helping classic dishes come alive. I'll guarantee you'll never, ever have had a rice pudding like this before. Next, my tricks of the trade and kitchen tips. First, how to zest a lemon. The important part is not to zest any of the pith. Watch the following technique and I'll show you how. We've got these original graters. Really important when we use this, we use the, the fine zester. Not the big rough one, not the one for slicing, and not the other one for grating. This little one here. Onto a plate, because it's always easier to lift off from the plate than it is the board. And the most important thing about zesting a lemon is nice long strokes, but twisting the lemon round. Every time we go down, we twist. Same with the orange and same with the lime. Little tap. If you go too far, 
Let me just show you. No, you've got that white, bitter pith that destroys the wonderful, zesty flavour. And look, that's what we're looking for there. This really nice, vibrant lemon zest. Delicious. Garlic is a key ingredient in so many spicy dishes. My tip for finally chopping and mincing is to add a pinch of salt for abrasion, which helps break the fibres of the garlic down for a much better result. For getting the most out of root ginger, simply remove the skin using a teaspoon. It's easier than using a knife, and you can get around the tricky bits. Or just keep the skin on and give it a good wash. Never throw out vanilla pods. There's a ton of flavour left in the skin. Stick inside jars of sugar and leave to infuse. Great to sprinkle on cakes, biscuits or porridge. When grinding up spices, if you have any left over, you can store it in an airtight jar for up to two months. Great for a spicy kick to have at your fingertips. Right, this is my guide to amazing home-cooked street food classics. Street food gets its name because it's cooked and eaten on the streets. From the hawker markets in Asia to the New York hot dog stands, there are some great chefs out there serving seriously delicious food that you can eat on the go. My first recipe is a special mix of fantastic flavours from around the world. Beef tacos with wasabi mayo. The great thing about street food is anything goes. The only rule is they've got to be really fast and really tasty. Now, these tacos mix a Mexican and Japanese flavours into a delicious, meaty mouthful. First off, get that pan really nice and hot. These are sirloin steaks. Sear it in the pan with all that fat on. It'll add flavour. Salt and pepper. A couple of tablespoons of olive oil in. Pan, nice and hot. Hold up the steak and lay it in. Always lay away. Give the pan a little shake and it stops the steak from sticking. We're looking for colour. And if it sticks, it's going to burn. While the steaks are cooking, I can get on with my super quick marinade. Now, two tablespoons of miso paste. That's a fermented soybean. That gives a really nice sort of rich sweetness. A tablespoon of sugar, a couple of tablespoons, rice wine. That gives it a really nice vinegary kick. A couple of tablespoons of olive oil, salt and pepper. I'm looking for a nice sort of thick, rich marinade. Marinade done, it's time to turn the steaks. Sort the pan and give the steaks a little base. All we're doing every time is just adding more and more flavour. Take your tongs and sort of lift the steak on its back and really melt all that fat down. Off with the gas. Take them out. Just take your knife. See all that fat there? Just slice that off. I don't want any of that. Now, in to the marinade. Beautiful. Tacos are one of Mexico's most popular street foods. They can be made from beef, pork, chicken or fish and are loaded up with amazing sauces and spices. Now, I want something sort of pickly. Cabbage. These are um, Chinese cabbages. Slice it in half. And look at it, really crisp and really tasty. We're going to slice that into quarters and then just shred it and take your time. Think of cabbage here and you think of sort of braised, overcooked cabbage, nothing worse. But in a taco, you want freshness, a little season of chili flakes. They sort of discreetly give it a little bit of heat, a little touch of rice wine vinegar. If you haven't got that, fresh lemon juice. A small drop of toasted sesame seed oil. Give that a really good mix. Now I need something to sort of bring it together. We take some wasabi paste, very hot, very spicy, a sort of thumbnail size. I'm going to mix that with a couple of tablespoons of mayonnaise. And give that a really good mix. 
These are basic corn tortilla. The trick is to sort of color them and then shape them, actually place it on the gas ring. Use some tongs so as not to burn yourself. You can also toast your tacos in a frying pan. From there, I'm just going to place it on the rolling pin. Literally 30 seconds as it cools down. The great thing about serving tacos is people can fill them themselves just the way they want them. Cabbage. Just squeeze out wet marinade. Make a nice, rustic little mountain. Mayonnaise on. Wait to see how soft and delicious and almost sort of melting in the mouth texture we've got on this amazing sirloin. So got that really nice sear around the outside. It's just nice and pink in the middle. Start off with my crispy shell. Back of the spoon with the wasabi mayonnaise inside the taco. And just sprinkle that delicious pickled cabbage. And then just start lining my taco with three or four slices. Touch more of my spicy mayo. And that is how I'd make the perfect taco. When you want comfort food quick, fast food classics always deliver. Here are three more of my street food favorites. All super easy, but still put the gourmet into grab and go. This street food dish packs a wonderful Indian influence. Subtly spiced chicken wrap. Grab a mortar and pestle to make a spicy marinade for the chicken. Crack open cardamom pods and add. Ground ginger coriander, cinnamon, grated nutmeg, cloves of garlic, fresh coriander, lemon juice, olive oil, and season. Now pulverize to form a paste. Pour over the chicken thighs and leave to marinate for up to two hours. To cook, griddle on a high heat get wonderfully charred meat. Once the chicken is cooked, warm through tortilla wraps on the same griddle. Then simply slice your chicken and put your wrap together. Top with shredded cabbage, chopped spring onion, and your favorite chili sauce. Ready in 20 minutes, sticky, succulent, an utterly Moorish spiced chicken wrap. You'll find my next fast food classic all over America, tasty chili dogs. For super quick and easy beef chili, add chopped onions to hot olive oil and cook until soft. Then add chopped garlic, a teaspoon of cumin seeds, and stir to release their lovely aromatic flavor. Next, chili powder. Turn up the heat and break beef mince into the pan. Brown and season. Add tomato puree and cook through. Next, a lug of spicy Worcestershire sauce. Chopped in tomatoes, dried oregano, add a sprinkle of sugar, Cook frankfurter or bratwurst sausages, bung in a bun, and simply top with the spicy beef chili. Easy and irresistible, a dog worth crossing the street for. My third street food inspired recipe is Vietnamese style baguette with beef. Start slicing sirloin steak into strips. Then simply marinate in soy sauce, the salty. And runny honey, the sweet. And leave for up to two hours. Then thread your marinated beef strips onto skewers. 
and pan fry in hot olive oil. For the topping, which adds a lovely sour contrast, grate carrot and simply leave to pickle in rice vinegar. Next, make the easy dressing. Simply de-seed and chop a chili. Add caster sugar and lime juice. Add a glug of fish sauce. Slice a baguette. When lovely and brown, the marinated steak skewers are done. Remove and add. Top with the pickled carrot. Add cool sliced cucumber. Drizzle over the spicy dressing. And to finish it off, add coriander leaves. Simple to make, but complex in flavor. Absolutely delicious. Three stunning recipes from the streets to your home, guaranteed to take food on the run to a whole new level. And so simple to do. You don't need to spend a fortune on masses of kitchen equipment. Here's my quick guide to another cooking essential. Frying pan. For me, one of my favorites. Why? Because it's so versatile. Whether you're searing the most amazing rack of lamb, cooking duck breast, sautéing chicken, or even a quick omelette, or even frying an egg, all in one. Look for an oven-proof frying pan with a metal handle if you want to cook like pros, by finishing off your dish in the oven or under a hot grill. Just don't forget, when you take it out, the handle will be hot. If you can, get a high-quality non-stick one with a thick, heavy base, which will distribute the heat evenly. Brilliant. Welcome back to my ultimate cookery course. Next, on my guide to street food, I'll be whipping up an indulgent finger-licking treat. That is amazing. But first... Like any passionate chef, I want the best ingredients I can find, whether it's for savoury or sweet dishes. Next up, my guide to buying chocolate. Chocolate gives you such an instant hit. It's well worth knowing about the good stuff. And who better to ask than award-winning alchemist of the sweetest kind, Paul Young. Even when I don't want to think about it, I'm thinking about it. His cutting-edge approach to chocolate making has won him accolades around the world. So when you're out shopping, the best way is to look at your chocolate bar, look on the back and look at the percentage. That gives you how much cocoa is in the bar. And the more cocoa, the more rich, intoxicating flavour. So the most exciting bit is tasting chocolate. Good quality fine chocolate should have that clean snap. Bite a piece off and crunch it in your teeth. But stop chewing. Let it melt. Move it around the mouth and you'll find that by letting it melt, even dark chocolate that you've had before that seems quite bitter won't be. When you chew quickly, it releases tannin. It releases all the bitterness in the chocolate. Letting it melt, it's smoother and richer and you get all the flavour. And most excitingly is, it releases something into the brain called dopamine, which makes you feel good. And that's how you get addicted to real chocolate. Chocolate is not just an addictive treat. It's an amazing ingredient. Here's my take on which kind to use for what. White chocolate, with its sweet vanilla taste, is perfect used as a dipping or pouring sauce with fresh fruit or frozen berries for a quick dessert. Creamy milk chocolate is great for family-friendly puddings and treats, like quick baked cakes or melt it onto homemade crepes or waffles. Dark chocolate is rich and intense. I like using 70% cocoa stuff. Use it for ice creams that really pack a punch. 100% pure cocoa has a very powerful, intense taste, and only the real chocolate geeks eat it straight. And remember, chocolate isn't just for sweet dishes. For the famous Mexican mole sauce, this is the one to grab. Is there anything better than chocolate? They say sex, but that's sort of totally overrated. Chocolate is the key ingredient in my favorite sweet fast food dishes, which at their best are always irresistible, instant, and utterly satisfying. So when you want an indulgent chocolate hit, my next recipe will be right up your alley. Malt chocolate donuts. Street food is all about satisfying your cravings. These donuts are sweet, sticky, and absolutely delicious. 
First off, we're going to make the dough. Now, this dough takes a bit of time, but it's really exciting. I'm heating all of the milk with the sugar. This yeast, easy to get hold of. And when you make fresh doughnuts, you need fresh yeast. Adding some of the warm milk to the yeast will activate it, which will help the dough to rise. Just half. Give that a quick whisk. The sugar's dissolved in the milk. The fresh yeast disintegrates instantly. Set the yeast mixture to one side while it does its job. To start the main dough mix, I'm adding half the butter to the remaining milk. That gives the dough a nice silkiness. I want it light. So melt the butter into the milk. Flour into a sieve. That helps to make the dough nice and smooth. And you know what? When you've got a smooth dough, it sort of rises evenly. Add a pinch of salt and two egg yolks. Pour in the warm milk and melted butter. Don't start over mixing it. When you over mix the dough of a donut, it gets really tight. You're not going to let it aerate. Yeast in. Ooh, nice and warm. I love that smell. Now, I'm looking for a sort of elastic y texture. Just dropping off the spoon. Nice. Flour of the board. Take the dough out. Lovely. Lightly sprinkle, touch more flour, and just pull it over and push in. And every time you're sort of turning it, almost like you're turning the dough into itself. The dough should just sort of relax. And it shouldn't be sticking to your fingers now. It's just nice and pliable. Set that in a nice clean bowl. A little sprinkling of flour in there. So as it starts to rise, it doesn't stick. Cover that with thin film. Leave the dough to rise in a warm place for 60 to 90 minutes until it's doubled in size. This stage is called proving. Now, whilst that's proving, get a pan on. For the chocolate filling or ganache, pour 500 mils of double cream into a saucepan and add honey. Bring the mixture to a gentle boil. Traditionally, we've always put jam in there, but chocolate and donuts, wow, to die for. Add the cream. That give that a good mix. The butter elevates the ganache into a really nice, shiny chocolate coat. Look at that. Whoa. Give it a really nice whisk. So the whisking gives it that aerated texture to the ganache. You're just lightening the load a little bit. Whoa. Nice. Chocolate filling done. Put it in the fridge to cool, then it's time to gently roll out the dough. Just let it roll naturally, about a centimetre and a half in depth. Slice. One. Two. Place them on to your tray and let them rise again. Once the donuts have had 30 to 40 minutes to rise, it's time to shallow fry them in a pan filled one third full with hot vegetable oil. Risen, but look, they're sort of like little pockets of air. Right, here we go. Place these in nice and carefully. Four, maximum. If there's too many in the pan, the oil will go cold and the donuts will come out soggy. Turn them over. Beautiful. They're going to come out into some sugar mixed with some malt powder. 50-50. How do you tell they're actually cooked in the centre? Tap on top. It should be hollow. In. And just sprinkle the malt and the sugar. Shake off the excess. I get so excited every time I make donuts. Now, look at those beauties. These are delicious, eaten as they are. But the ganache is going to be the icing on the cake. Pipe them back. Peel the bag over your hand. Don't forget to pop the nozzle in. I want the texture. Almost like a little liquid inside. So I'm going to pipe them when they're a little bit warm. Hopefully, with that burst of magic. Operation Donut. Lift up the donut. 
Squeeze, push in and fill. Just do you start seeing that chocolate coming out. And sit that back down. Mmm. Nice. Sit them on there. They've got a little bit heavier, and we all know why. Nice. That one's got my name on it. Oh, that is amazing. Oh. Next, my tricks of the trade and kitchen tips. Starting with how to do your steak the way you want it. I want to cook my steak rare, so by touching the steak, I want the same feedback as it is on the inside of my thumb. That's rare. As it starts to cook, it gets a lot firmer. Medium is there, semi-firm with a slight resistance. Well done is there. Rare. A great tip for getting meat or fish to cook faster is to score it, which allows the heat to penetrate quicker. This also allows marinades to be absorbed more deeply. For stain-free Tupperware, coat it thinly with oil, which acts as a barrier between plastic and food. It's so easy to make your own chili sherry to use in quick stir-fries or sauces. Take 450 mils of dry sherry, such as fino, and using a funnel, pour into a sterilized bottle. Add five whole Thai chilies, seal with a cork or lid, and leave to infuse for a couple of weeks. My tip for using any discarded chili seeds is plant them to grow yourself some new chili peppers. Plant in an eggshell or seedling trays. Start them indoors and move outside when they're ready. Follow my ultimate cookery course crammed with key lessons. Top tips and 100 recipes to stake your life on, and you'll literally be cooking yourself into a better chef. Many of these amazing recipes are on my app. Please check out the App Store for details. Go on, get cooking.